Okay, so let's uh, get started. This is um, first lecture for the course. Introduction to functional analysis. Okay, so let me give you uh, a brief preview or, or a few words about what functional analysis uh, is or, or initially aimed to do. So, um, you know, by this point you've taken, or at least what the prerequisites are supposed to be, you've taken linear algebra, you've taken calculus, and what these uh, subjects allow you to do is solve problems where um, you know, you have finitely many independent variables, if you like. Okay, you're working in finite dimensions. So you always have, for example, in calculus, you're trying to find the min or max of a, fun of a function of one, two, three, or four variables, right? Or in linear algebra, you're trying to solve a linear uh, set of linear equations, but there's, you know, five equations and five, uh, five unknowns. Um, so there's always finitely many uh, independent uh, variables. Now, that uh, allows you to solve a lot of fun problems of, you know, how fast water is leaking from a cone. I think that's one of the problems you solve or, or something of that sort. Um, but then when you move on in life, you come across uh, ODEs and PDEs. Uh, and other types of minimization, maximization problems, where now, if you'd like, the set of independent variables um, is no longer finite dimensional, okay? So let's think of the number of, or your independent variable as, as being a member of some vector space, okay? So when we were talking about calculus, you know, functions of one, two, or three variables, these are functions of you know, R, R2, R3, so on and so on. But uh, it turns out that if you want to consider, uh, for example, what's the shortest curve between two points, this is a natural functional, meaning, uh, well, this is terminology that means now the argument is a function, um, that the points, your independent variables, are curves, are functions. And, you know, it takes, uh, for a vector in R3, say, it takes three numbers to specify um, a vector, right, the three coordinates. How many numbers do you need to specify, say, a continuous curve uh, on the interval, say, 0, 1? Well, you need inf infinitely many numbers. You need to know the graph of that curve. Um, so functional analysis, in short, uh, was built to be able to start solving problems where the vector spaces are not necessarily um, finite dimensional. And, and as we'll see in the, in the problems that we work through um, and the situations that pop up, um, this arises quite naturally for very um, particular, I mean not particular, but for concrete problems, okay? This is not just sort of a, um, you know, some sort of academic exercise. These, this whole subject grew out of, you know, trying to understand particular uh, concrete problems um, involving PDEs and, and, and minimization and uh, optimization of now um, functions of functions. That was the original terminology, functions of functions, where now the vector space is some space of functions, not just spaces of uh, say three-dimensional vectors or two-dimensional vectors, and thus the name functional. Okay, so that's uh, um, a few words about, you know, how this uh, subject grew, what's kind of the point. So let's start getting into specifics. So again, I'm going to be using a lot of terminology that comes from linear algebra and, you know, the real analysis course, um, 18100B. Um, but at the start, I'll be reminding you of what some of these, you know, terms that I'm using mean. And, but as the course goes on, I will stop, you know, 
redefining terms that you should have seen in, in real analysis or linear algebra and just use them. Okay, so the first topic uh, that we're going to deal with, so our norm spaces, these are kind of the central objects in, or starting point in functional analysis, which are the analog of uh, R, R2, R3, and so on. So what's the setup? Let V be a vector space over R or even C, so it could be a complex uh, vector space. and. Either of these spaces we'll usually denote by a bold face K. Okay. So what does this mean? So again, this is one of those uh, points where I'll just quickly remind you what a vector space is. Um, then V comes with two operations uh, plus and scalar multiplication, so plus going from V cross V into V, so which we denote if I have two vectors uh, in V, they get mapped to the new vector, which I denote V1 plus V2, and then I have scalar multiplication from uh, the set of scalars cross V into V, and this goes alpha V gets mapped to alpha times V. All right, and these, so you have these two operations, and they satisfy certain conditions, um, assumptions, uh, relations between them, which are part of the axioms of a vector space, which you can read in the last section of the notes uh, if you want to refresh your memory. And so, so V as a vector space has these two operations satisfying a certain set of axioms. And so, for example, uh, familiar old examples, R2, Rn, and then, of course, C, the set of N tuples of uh, R or C. But here's a... a you know, another simple example, uh, C01, which I'll remind you, this uh, notation here means the set of functions from 01 into, let's say, their complex value just to fix a, a, a field of scalars to, to work with, such that F is continuous, meaning it's continuous at every point. This is also a, a vector field because the sum of two continuous functions um, is continuous, and if I take a scalar multiple of a continuous function, then that's also continuous, and then these operations satisfy the axioms that you need for a vector space. Um, but there really is a, a big, um, pun intended, difference between you know, these spaces here and these spaces here, or that space there. And what is the, the difference, uh, the size, okay? Now, in analysis, you know, size was, um, you know, you kind of had maybe one or two different notions of size you were introduced to, depending on how much analysis you've seen, but one was cardinality. That's not what I'm talking about when I mean size. Uh, what I mean is the following. I mean the dimension of these spaces, so let me... Recall the following definition that we say a vector space V is finite dimensional, and these were a lot of the vector spaces you were first introduced to, if every linearly independent set is, in fact, a finite set. And so let me again, since I'm using some of these words to, to help you recall, what does this mean 
in math, this means for every set E that is uh, linearly independent, meaning which have the following properties, so that if I take any elements in E, that so E satisfies that if I take any uh, finitely many elements of E, the assumption that there's a linear combination of them giving zero implies that all of these scalars must be zero. Okay, so this here uh, is the definition of being linearly independent for all E satisfying this condition. So this is kind of poorly written, but I hope you follow. This is the definition of linearly independence. Then for every set that's linearly independent, then this set E is finite in the sense of cardinality, okay? In the sense there's only, you know, a hundred elements in there or not. Um, so this is finite dimensional and say V is infinite dimensional if V is not finite dimensional. So some of you I saw have taken a course from me before. I tend to use uh, um, a lot of uh, abbreviations when I write, but typically these abbreviations are pretty clear what they mean if you just sound it out. Um, so vector space V, and these infinite dimensional guys, these are the guys we're going to be uh, dealing with a lot in this course. Um, the finite dimensional ones you dealt with in, in linear algebra, maybe you used a few, you had a few infinite dimensional examples, you know, if you were looking at examples of vector spaces, but these infinite dimensional vector spaces, these are the type of guys or, or the type of vector spaces we're now going to solve linear equations on, okay? And, um, and in some sense do calculus on, okay? That's not quite true, but we're going to use calculus and some tools to be able to say some things about, uh, um, you know, linear equations on, on, uh, on these infinite dimensional spaces. But they won't just be any type of infinite dimensional space, and we'll say, I'll say what type we're looking at in a minute. So, um, okay, so finite dimensional, infinite dimensional. So the first uh, set of examples, R1, R2, Rn, Cn, so on, those are finite dimensional. Uh, spaces, um, and the dimension is n, if I had to find what the dimension is. What is an example of uh, infinite dimensional? Well, you can probably guess, since I led up to it with saying this, there's a big difference between this one and uh, our n and cn. Uh, the space of continuous functions on the interval 0, 1, this is infinite dimensional. And why is that? This is because the set for like E given by the functions fn of x equals x to the n. Here n is a natural number or zero. Uh, this is a linearly independent set. I'll let you think about why that is. Um, and you see that it's not a finite set. It contains infinitely many different functions. Okay, so this is uh, a linearly independent set, okay? So like I said, what we're going to be dealing with um, is how to handle, you know, solving linear equations or, or questions about analysis that we'll need to, to solve other problems on these infinite dimensional spaces, okay? unlike in the past where we did analysis on finite dimensional spaces, you know, and the types of, um, the types of things you proved uh, in the analysis class were, you know, something like 
um, the heine borel theorem uh, that closed and bounded subsets of Rn are um, compact, meaning every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. This is, in fact, something you proved to show that every continuous function on a closed, on, uh, a closed and bounded set has a min and a max in that set. Um, but that statement that I just said about the heine borel theorem, that is not true once we get to infinite dimensions. And so we have to, you know, if we want to be able to, to solve problems, we'll have to develop some machinery to get around that. It is one of the main uh, uh, issues that arises when you move from doing analysis on uh, finite dimensions to infinite dimensions. Okay? So, okay, so mathematically I've been, I haven't said much but I have been trying to uh, gin up the subject uh, to make sure you stay engaged. So, all right, so we have vector spaces, but to do analysis, we need some sort of notion of how close things are. And to do that, we introduced a notion of a norm, so a norm on a vector space V. If I don't know, if I don't write vector space V, you should, uh, you know, say to yourself, this capital V is a vector space. A norm on a vector space V, this is a function. This is going to be an object that generalizes length. So it's a function from V to a set of non-negative numbers with three properties that we kind of associate to length. Namely, that uh, the norm of V is zero implies, um, well, I should say, if and only if V equals zero. Uh, two, if I take V and I multiply it by a scalar, and then I take its length, I should get something like uh, that scalar times the length of the vector, right? If I take a vector, multiply it by two, uh, I should get twice times the length of the vector. So this is expressed by this, and this is for all lambda in my field of scalars, and for all v and v. So this um, property here is referred to as homogeneity. This property here is referred to as definiteness. Definite. I don't know if I'm spelling that right, but definiteness. And then the third property is that it satisfies the triangle inequality. Okay, this is a, um, that for all v1, v2, and v, the norm of v1 plus v2, this is less than or equal to the norm of v1 plus v2, okay? And any vector space that has a norm on it, we call a normed space. is what we call a norm space. Okay, and this thing here I usually, so is referred to as the triangle inequality. All right, so a vector space with a function on it that satisfies these three properties we call uh, a norm space. Okay, um, and then, so like I said in my past classes, Whenever I see a decent, whenever you see a decent uh, definition or, or, you know, something with substance, you should do examples. We'll do that in just a minute after I give a few more definitions. Um, so let me just add to this one. This was the definition of a norm. A semi-norm wants to be a norm, but it's not quite is a function which I'll also denote uh, with these, uh, you know, two parallel lines on each side. It 
it is a function satisfying uh, homogeneity and the uh, triangle inequality, but not necessarily uh, positive or, or definiteness or, or positive definiteness is also what that goes by, satisfying two and three, but maybe not you know necessarily one. Okay. Again, semi-norms kind of pop up in a natural way. Um, and I'll give you an example in just a second. Uh, so first off, we have this notion of length in a vector space, which is uh, a norm. And if we're given a norm on a vector space, we can associate a metric. So remember, a metric, uh, so from real analysis, I want you to recall that, that a function, d, on a set if x is a set, a function d from x cross x into 0 infinity is a metric if you have three conditions. Uh, Satisfied, A, so the distance between uh, a point in itself, or let me write it this way, the distance between two points is zero if and only if x equals y, B, for all x, y in the set x, dx, y equals d, y, x, this is uh, symmetry of the of the distance, and you have the triangle inequality for the distance for all x, y, and x, d, for all x, y, and z, and x, d, x, y is less than or equal to the distance from x to z plus the distance from z to y. So if I have a vector space and I have a norm on it, I can turn that space now into a metric space. And this metric that I'm about to write down is usually referred to as the metric induced by the, by the norm. So our first little kind of mini theorem here if I have a norm on a vector space, then D of, I'm going to use the same, if I define a function dVw to be simply the length of V minus W, so for elements of V and W in the uh, vector space, defines metric on B, okay? And this metric we refer to as the metric induced by the norm, all right? Um, and this is not difficult to prove. Basically, 1, 2, and 3 imply respectively, uh, you know, A, B, and C. Uh, one, the first property of a norm implies A. This is pretty clear. Um, you know, the distance between V, W is zero if and only if V minus W equals zero, which is if and only if V equals W. That gives us part A. Uh, B, we get from two. Uh, since by two, um, V minus W is equal to minus one times W minus V equals now we pull the scalar out and take its absolute value. So since by 2 we have uh, the length of V minus W equals the length of W minus V, this implies B. And then C just follows again immediately from the triangle inequality 3, 
by just adding and subtracting uh, a third element. So, and then, so let me just write 3 implies C, you know, essentially immediately. All right. Okay. So when we have a norm, we get a notion of a metric, a notion of distance between two vectors in our vector space by just taking the length of the difference of them. So again, this should sort of, um, you know, this is supposed to be an analog of, of uh, the, what we see in R and uh, Rn in general. So, so for example, let me just recall this. So now let's look at a few norms. Um, the set of n tuples of Rn or Cn where we have the Euclidean norm. Euclidean norm. Here, uh, if I have an n tuple given by x, so let me put a 2 here to denote this norm, then the Euclidean norm of this vector, uh, so this guy is in, you know, Rn or Cn, then its uh, Euclidean norm is given by the sum uh, i equals 1 to n xi link squared 1 half. Okay, and that gives you, uh, um, you know, the standard notion of length and distance between points that you've dealt with in Euclidean space, all right? But that's not the only norm you could have on these, um, these spaces that you dealt with before. Uh, another one, let me put an infinity here. This norm is the max between, for I, uh, between 1 and n of xi. So to measure the length of a vector, I take this to be the magnitude of the largest um, entry in that vector, okay? All right. Um, and in general, there's a whole family of norms I could put on Rn or Cn. Let me put a p here. This is norm, the LP norm, little LP norm, is the sum of the pth power of the xi's raised to the 1 over p. Of course, you need this 1 over p for homogeneity to work out and also the triangle inequality. Okay, and this is for 1 less than or equal to p less than infinity. All right. I didn't write infinity there because that doesn't make sense, although you can actually prove that if I take a fixed vector and I let p go to infinity, then this quantity here converges to this quantity. All right, that's not hard to show. Um, so let me quickly draw you a quick picture of what the unit balls look like in uh, R2 say with the different norms. So uh, let me recall that if I have uh, in a metric space um, a metric, then BXR, this is a set of all Y and X, so that uh, the distance from X to Y is less than or equal to R. Um, now you know what the ball looks like for the Euclidean norm. This is just, you know, a circle and filled in, of course. Uh, I'm not going to fill this in, so now what I'm looking at is, and I'll put a 2. This is the ball centered at 0 of radius 1. Um, so everything inside. What about for uh, the infinity norm, let's say I want to look at uh, 
what does this look like? This, in fact, is a square. Okay. And what about, let's do one more. How about the little L1 norm, which is just the length of uh, the magnitude of the entry, entries, the length of the absolute value of the entries, then so all these go through these points here on the axis. Um, this ball, so first off, uh, everything inside the blue is the L infinity ball. Everything inside the white is that little L2 ball. The little L1 ball is everything inside of this square, which is now tilted. And every other little LP ball is in between the yellow and the blue. And if you take P goes to infinity, then that ball converges in a certain sense to this L infinity ball, which is in blue. OK? So you see, changing the norm, even on these finite dimensional spaces, changes um, you know, kind of the, the geometry of the, the balls, if you like, all right? But not in too drastic of a way, meaning if I take a large enough B, if I take a large enough L1 ball, that will swallow up an L infinity ball, uh, and therefore the two balls are kind of, uh, and you know, I, I can take the size of that ball to be, you know, maybe uh, of size three. And so, you know, the balls are kind of the same, all right? One can always be sandwiched in the other. I'll talk a little more about that when we talk about equivalent norms, um, at least in the problem sets. So, okay, so that's an example of norms on a finite dimensional vector space. Let's look at uh, another norm. Let's say, uh, let's take a metric space. So I remember we have a, a, so this is just any old metric space. And now I'm going to define a vector space, C lower infinity x. This is defined to be the set of all uh, continuous functions on this metric space. Okay, remember if we have a metric space, we have a notion of continuous functions on it. Um, such that, what? So these are, so again, to fix this, let me just clarify where it's going. F goes from x to, let's say, c. Um, such that f is continuous and f is bounded, okay? Meaning the image of x under f is a bounded subset of c, all right? So just uh, so you can connect this with something I just wrote down a minute ago, the set of all bounded functions, continuous functions on 0, 1, this is just the set of continuous functions on 0, 1, because we know bound, uh, continuous functions on a closed and bounded interval are bounded. Uh, so I don't have to say bounded whenever I write this. Um, OK, so I have this space of continuous functions on a metric space uh, which are bounded. And I'm going to define a norm on this. Uh, so this is a vector space. Because any, uh, the sum of two continuous functions is continuous. Scalar multiple times a continuous function is continuous. So, and again, those two operations satisfy the axioms of a vector space. And I can define a norm on this space. Then I claim that, uh, what do I use here? Then if I define uh, 
an infinity norm again, which will look similar to what I wrote up there as this is the soup of all x and capital X of u of x, uh, then this is a norm on this space of continuous, bounded continuous functions. Okay? Okay, so uh, one and two are, prob are pretty easy to see from the definition. So properties one and two are easy to see. For the triangle inequality, well, that follows essentially from the triangle inequality for C. These are C-valued, complex-valued functions. If you like, uh, you know, replace it with, with real-valued functions. Um, if that makes you feel better in the first lecture, although we'll need complex numbers eventually. Um, so let's check that this function satisfies the triangle inequality and therefore is a norm. Um, if u and v are two bounded continuous functions on x, then for all x in x, if I take ux plus vx, this is less than or equal to um, by the triangle inequality for c, the absolute value of u of x plus v of x. Again, u of x is a complex number, and so is v of x. So this is by triangle inequality But now, this, uh, for any old x, is always bounded by the supremum of that over all values, okay? So let me write okay? So u of x for any fixed value of x is always bounded by the supremum over all x's in the capital X, which is the norm of u. So what I've shown is that for all x, in capital X, the absolute value of u of x plus v of x is bounded by this number, okay? And therefore, this number is an upper bound for the set of absolute values of these guys. And therefore, the supremum, which implies that is the least upper bound of all these quantities as x ranges over x is less than or equal to uh, this number here. And therefore, we have the triangle inequality for this function, and therefore, this defines a norm, which I'll often, often refer to as the uniform no norm or L infinity norm just because there's an infinity, but, uh, you know, the content should be clear on... Um, you know, what I'm talking about. I mean, this is not inconsistent with what I wrote down because, you know, Rn, that's just a set of, well, okay, never mind. Let me, let me stop talking before I get myself uh, twisted in a knot. So what does convergence mean in this norm here, right? We know what convergence means in the kind of Euclidean or any of these norms. It means the points are getting together. You know, the, the fixed points in the plane are starting to get closer and closer together, at least in R2 or C2. What about here? Now, um, so let me just note that, so remember, UN converges to U in this space of bounded continuous functions. What does this mean? This means the distance between UN and U goes to zero as N goes to infinity. Um, so here I'm talking about what is convergence of a sequence of elements of this space mean. So that means that the distance between un and u goes to zero as uh, n goes to infinity. And the distance, remember, is defined in terms of the norm. So So convergence in um, the space of bounded continuous functions just means this, okay? 
But in terms of something you know covered in past analysis class, what is this? What is that? Uh, you know, equivalent to. I'll write it out. This means for all epsilon positive, there exists a natural number n such that. Now this is the sup of u of x for all, or sup of u n of x minus u of x for all x and x. So I can write such that. Uh, for all n bigger than or equal to n, for all x and x, u n of x minus u of x is less than epsilon. Um, but that's just the definition of uniform convergence uniformly on x. Okay. So the point of this little note is that convergence in this norm or in this metric, I'm, I'm going to use norm and metric interchangeably uh, because this metric is induced by this norm. So convergence in norm in the space of bounded continuous functions is the same as saying that this sequence of functions converges to this function uniformly on x. Okay, so I hope that's, I hope that's clear. Um, you know, when you look, when you, so maybe I should say this now instead of in the eighth lecture, uh, but, you know, really take the time to actually watch these lectures, you know, for two reasons. One, I'm actually here recording them, you know, so uh, instead of just saying read this and ask me if you have any questions, so, you know, I'm giving you some more insight than just what's in the notes. And two, it keeps you engaged, okay? So you should treat these as, you know, you actually being there. Have your notebook, take notes as I lecture. Um, the great thing is, is that you can pause, all right, and, re and rewind. The space of continuous functions, um, we have that norm. Okay, so some more examples of norm spaces. is, so I was calling that little lp uh, norm, um, but the little is not necessarily little. So the actual little lp space that I will typically uh, refer to, this is going to be the space of all, um, this is the space of all sequences now, all right? so. The vectors in this space are sequences, the points in this space are sequences, such that, uh, so call this thing element A. So A is a sequence. So this is a set of all sequences that have uh, LP norm that's finite. And what is the LP norm in this case? Uh, well, it's a natural generalization of that guy, where the LP norm is equal to uh, sum j equals 1 to infinity for uh, 1 p, uh, p between 1 and infinity, and then the L infinity norm is just soup over J okay all right so uh, little LP stands for the space of sequences um, with finite LP norm or you could say their LP summable their pth power is summable um, so Let me just kind of state a, a silly example. The sequence 1 over j, j equals 1 to infinity. This is in little lp for all p bigger than 1, but not for p equals 1, because then we get the harmonic series. Now, why, uh, first off, 
why the triangle inequality holds uh, even in, you know, finitely many, uh, in the finite dimensional case, and, you know, why this is an actual vector space um, is non-trivial, okay? So you shouldn't be able to actually see, you know, say, oh, okay, that makes sense. It satisfies the triangle inequality. It's not clear. Uh, it's it's non-trivial that this is, in fact, uh, a norm. This one's, you know, easier to see, but it's not clear for P bigger than one that this is a norm, um, and that, therefore, little LP, uh, and that the sum of two guys and little LP are in LP so that this is an actual vector space and then we have the triangle inequality so that this is a norm. That'll be in the, in the exercises, but just take it as, take me at my word that um, this is indeed a vector space. If I take two sequences that are uh, in little LP, meaning their pth power is summable, then uh, their sum, you know, entry by entry, is also in little LP and so on, and that uh, this function here defines a norm on this space, little lp. Okay, so just, you know, accept that. Okay. And so, now we're not interested, so we've kind of gone a little bit, uh, you know, narrowed down our spaces we're interested in a little bit more, so we've gone from you know, general infinite dimensional vector spaces now to norm spaces being our interest, uh, what we're interested in, but we're not exactly interested in just any normed uh, vector space. The, you know, central objects in, in functional analysis that we're interested in are kind of, you know, the analogs of, of Rn. Now, what property that Rn and Cn have is that their metric, that this uh, metric that you have on these uh, sets is complete, right? That Cauchy sequences always converge. And this is our next narrowing down of the spaces we're interested in. And these have a special name. So, these are called Bonnach spaces after Stefan Bonnach. So, Normed space, so a vector space with a norm, is a Banach space if is complete with respect to the metric induced by the norm. Okay, so we have um, we have a norm space. We have a metric that's associated to that by defining uh, the distance between two guys um, by that uh, uh, equation up there. And so we say it's a Banach space if that metric uh, is complete, meaning Cauchy sequences in that space with respect to this uh, metric. Uh, converge in the space. Now, you know, in, in um, you know, first year analysis, you learn that um, the set of rational numbers, they are not complete. There are Cauchy sequences which do not converge uh, to a rational number. You know, every real number, uh, you can write as a limit as, uh, you know, finitely many decimals. So, you know, square root of two will be kind of a number where you can form a, a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers converging to it, but it's not a rational number, so, you know, uh, the rational numbers are not complete. But R, you know, is complete, and in general we give a name to those normed linear space, those normed spaces, uh, such that this metric is complete, uh, we call those Banach spaces. So let me... So examples which you saw at least for the Euclidean norm and should be able to prove on your own, um, assuming you know uh, the triangle inequality for the little LP norms. Um, these are 
complete with respect to um, any of the little LP norms. Okay. All right. Now let's do a non-trivial one. Uh, let's show that um, the space of bounded continuous functions on a metric space uh, is complete. Make this a theorem. Uh, if x is A complete metric space, then is a Bonnock space. BSP, that's my abbreviation for Bonnock space. Okay? All right. So for a complete metric space, the space of bounded continuous functions on X is a Bonnock space. All right? We've already shown that that function over there defines a norm on it, so I'm saying it's complete with respect to that norm. Okay? Cauchy sequences always converge in this space. So let me just write this out. We want to show that uh, every Cauchy sequence U n in the space C of bounded continuous functions uh, has a limit in the space of bounded continuous functions. Okay? All right. So Let's take a Cauchy sequence. And the way, you know, this proof is going to work is the way essentially, you know, really all of the proofs of showing something as a Bonnock space works um, is you take a Cauchy sequence, then you'll be able to come up with, you know, a candidate for the limit. And then your job is to show two things, that that candidate is in the space uh, itself and then that the convergence happens. Okay? And sometimes those two come together, or, or it can be done at the same time. So, and you'll see what I mean. Let uh, UN be a Cauchy sequence and C infinity in the space of bounded continuous functions. First off, I claim that this forms a bounded sequence in this space. Uh, this is, you know, a fact from metric space theory, but I'll write it out again. Then uh, there exists a natural number in not such that for all n bigger than or equal to n not, uh, the difference between uh, u n not and u. So let me say. For all nm bigger than or equal to n naught, un minus um in the infinity norm is less than one. Okay. So what I'm first going to do, I'm first going to show that this sequence of functions are bounded in this space. Okay. Each of them are of course bounded, but I'm saying that they form a bounded sequence in this space. Okay. Um, then 
see. Here, rewrite this. For all n bigger than or equal to n naught, u n in norm, this is less than or equal to u n minus u n naught plus u n naught, and this is less than one plus u n naught. Okay, so for all n bigger than or equal to this fixed number n zero, u uh, n and L infin and infinity norm are bounded by one plus the norm of this fixed guy. Okay, then for all in a natural number, the norm of u n is less than or equal to if I put u one right now if n is bigger than or equal to n naught then this is less than or equal to this guy so it's certainly less than or equal to uh, some non-negative things plus this guy all right meanwhile if n is less than n naught then the norm of it is less than or equal to one of these norms that appear here which is also again less than or equal to this entire number that I wrote down here all right and let me define that to be this number b so I've shown for all natural numbers n the norm of uh, un is bounded by b. So this forms a bounded sequence in the space of bounded continuous functions. Okay, you have to keep track of uh, where this bounded, where I'm saying this bounded, is taking place. Each of these functions uh, is bounded, is a bounded function. What I'm saying here is that they form a bounded sequence in this space. Okay. Um, okay, so let me, uh, let me make a note of this. This is bounded by this, okay? All right, now what do we know? Um, and let me, in fact, I should have written this out over here, but let me write it out again. What does it mean for this sequence to be Cauchy in this space? This means for all epsilon positive, there exists a natural number n such that for all n m bigger than or equal to n, u n minus u m, and uh, this uniform norm is less than epsilon, okay? Now, since for all x, I have that un of x minus um of x, an absolute value is less than or equal to the soup over all x's in capital X, which is just the uh, uniform norm, the L infinity norm on this space. Um, and I am assuming it's Cauchy, so it satisfies this property. I get that for all x and x, the sequence now of uh, complex numbers, un of x. So this is now just a sequence of complex numbers. It's the value. I take x, I stick it into u sub n. Um, I have now a sequence of complex numbers. This is a Cauchy sequence. All of this, you know, may seem a little bit weird at first, but after I finish this proof, do it again now for little l infinity, okay? And you'll start getting the hang and seeing how the arguments go, okay? So, all right, so for every x in capital X, u n of x, so that's now a sequence of complex numbers, and 
yeah, I thought I didn't need it to be complete. I don't know why I wrote it down. Any metric space, if x is a metric space, then, okay. All right, so for each x in the metric space, un of x, which is now forming a sequence of complex numbers, this is a Cauchy sequence, all right? But the space of complex numbers, this is um, a complete metric space, right? And therefore, uh, for each x, this sequence has a limit. So, by completeness of C, for all x in capital X, this sequence un of x has a limit. In C. And now I define what will be my candidate function u of x to be this pointwise limit. U limit as n goes to infinity of u sub n of x. Okay? So in fact, in you know a few words, if you remember what these words mean, what we've shown is that every Cauchy sequence in the space of bounded continuous functions has a pointwise limit. Okay? Okay, then now what we're going to show is that this guy is in fact in the space of bounded continuous functions and that we have convergence of this sequence of functions to u in the space C infinity x, in the space of bounded continuous functions. We've only defined this guy as the pointwise limit. Uh, so as the pointwise limit of these guys. Okay. Then for all x and capital X, the absolute value of u of x is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity. So the absolute value of the limit, but since this converges, this is equal to the limit of the absolute values. And each of these guys are bounded by b. Um, they're bounded by the infinity norm, which is bounded by b, so this is less than or equal to b. Okay? And thus, so this is a bounded function at least on this metric space. All right? So now we're going to achieve two things at once. We're going to show that it's continuous and that we have convergence uh, in this space by showing it is, um, by showing this L infinity norm of the difference goes to zero of u minus u n, okay? Okay, so first we're going to show uh, that, so think of this just now as a, a function, not necessarily a norm. So, okay, maybe I'm being too um, careful. I'm just going to say now we're going to show that this quantity here goes to zero, all right? as n goes to infinity. And how do we do this? Well, uh, since um, we're just going to do this the old-fashioned way of let epsilon be positive and show um, that we can choose an n such that this is less than or equal to epsilon. I know in the definition you're supposed to have less than epsilon, but less than or equal to is, is good enough. Um, okay, so 
let epsilon be positive, since this sequence is Cauchy in this space, this implies there exists a natural number n such that for all n m bigger than or equal to n, I have that u n minus u m l infinity is less than, all right, let's make it epsilon over 2. Then for all n m bigger than or equal to m, this means u n of x, um, so let x be in capital X. We now want to show that for all little n bigger than or equal to capital N, in fact, u n minus u in this norm is less than or equal to epsilon over 2. For all n m bigger than or equal to n, I have that u, which is less than or equal to u n minus u m. And therefore, if I take the limit as m goes to infinity, remember u of x is the pointwise limit. I fixed x in capital X. I get that for all n bigger than or equal to m, u n of x minus u of x is less than or equal to epsilon over 2. So what have I shown? I've shown for all n bigger than or equal to capital N, and this capital N came from this condition, not anything having to do with x. It came from this condition. Uh, I have u n, u n of x minus u of x is less than or equal to epsilon over 2. And therefore, the soup over all x's is less than or equal to epsilon over 2. which is less than epsilon. Thus, un converges to u, or I should say, as n goes to infinity. Now, what's the last step? I have this candidate u, un's converge to u in uh, this, with respect to this sense. I need to conclude also that u is an element of the space of bounded continuous functions. I know it's bounded. Why is it continuous? Well, uh, since u n minus u goes to 0, this implies that u n, by what we uh, remarked a little bit earlier, means u n converges to u uniformly on x. And since u is the uniform limit of a sequence of continuous functions, that implies that u uh, is continuous. So let me just uh, reiterate what we've done. In sequence, we've shown that ux is bounded. We've then shown that uh, the soup over all x and x, so we should have uh, put that in yellow. Uh, we've shown convergence to u with respect to this uh, norm. And we've shown u is, in fact, in the space. So therefore, u is in. So. I.e. space is complete, and therefore a Banach space. Okay. So
So, you know, the first time you see that proof, and this, again, this is kind of how all the proofs of something being a Banach space goes. Um, when you see that for the first time, it's a little, it's a little weird, okay? Um, but, and, and this will be in the exercise, you can get a jump start on that by looking at maybe the simplest one. Um, well, I still have space over here. So, uh, little LP this is a bonic space for all uh, P between 1 and infinity. Um, another space which, okay, maybe maybe try your hand at this one instead of little l infinity because at least something's a little different. Um, little c0 which is the set of sequences in little l infinity. So each element of C0 is a sequence uh, in, of a bounded sequence such that uh, limit j goes to infinity of a j equals 0. This is also a Banach space. Okay, so you know, I encourage you to, to Take this example of bounded uh, sequences that converge to zero. First off, uh, you know it's pretty clear it's a vector space. Um, it's actually a subspace, and I'll get to, to you know subspaces of Banach spaces um, next lecture. But um, with so is a Banach space with you know the L infinity norm. So again, how would you, you know, prove that uh, this is a Banach space? You would take a co-sheet. So, you know, you have to start thinking of um, again these Banach spaces. These spaces you're looking at can be made up of kind of complicated things. You know, little LP. This is a space of sequences. So each point in the space is a sequence. Right? It's a sequence of numbers. Um, and here, you know, so your sequence of points is a sequence of sequences. All right? Just like in the example we did here, your sequence of points in your space of bounded continuous functions is a sequence of functions. Here we have a sequence of sequences, which again, that a sequence is just a function, so you shouldn't be too scared. But um, you know, try your hand at showing that this is a Banach space just from, um, you know, what we've done so far, uh, following this kind of blueprint. And, and again, it'll be kind of the same. You first show that a Cauchy sequence in here is in fact bounded, okay? Then show that uh, point-wise each of the, in here, point-wise should mean each of the entries of your sequence of sequences uh, forms a Cauchy sequence. Then that allows you to obtain a candidate sequence as the limit of your sequence of sequences. All right? And then you have to show again through this argument that, that uh, you do have um, convergence with respect to this norm, um, that that sequence is bounded, and in fact, that that sequence satisfies this condition in order to be in this space. Um, okay, so I think I'll stop there. <laughs>